Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Lane. I'm a longtime physics faculty member, uh, now emeritus, uh, which means you know I don't really do anything, and and they don't pay me, and and I get free parking every place on the campus. So if any of you would like my parking stick, it uh, we can we can talk later about uh, maybe working something out. It is, it is my great pleasure this evening to welcome all of you to Rice University and the Baker Institute for our uh, uh, civic scientist lecture. Many of you are regulars, and we very much appreciate your support. This evening, uh, we are honored to have as our civic scientist lecturer, Dr. Vince Cerf, who with his colleague, Bob Kahn, actually did invent the internet. The evening lecture is a key element of the Baker Institute civic scientist program and the Civic Scientist Lecture Series highlights outstanding scientists, engineers, technical professionals, who in addition to making significant contributions in their own special fields, uh, also contribute to the general public uh, good through significant contributions in policy and in, in, in other ways. The goal of our program is to encourage others to follow in the footsteps of folks like uh, Dr. Vince Cerf, uh, spread the word, I mean, help bridge the gap between science, technology, and, uh, and uh, the general public. We also have, in addition to our lecture, we also have an outreach program which takes many scientists, engineers out into the schools, so far of the order 3,600 uh, over the last uh, four years, and Vint uh, met with uh, high school students uh, this morning, uh, and. Uh, uh, had good conversations, I understand, and good questions. The uh, program, of course, would not be possible without the generosity of our sponsors. Uh, we receive enthusiastic support, I would say, from deans. If you can have enthusiastic support from deans, you're in really good shape. So <laughs> our deans of natural science, the White School of Natural Science, and the George R. Brown School of Engineering. But we want to give special thanks to Winifer and Benjamin uh, Chang for their considerable support of our civic scientist program. And so it's now, now my privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Vince Cerf, who's internationally known as the father of the internet. Of course, he needs no introduction, but he'll get a little one anyway. Uh, Dr. Cerf is a graduate of Stanford uh, and UCLA. He's worked in academia and industry in the federal government, starting with the U.S. Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which many of you know as DARPA, uh, where he began to address kind of vexing problem of how to connect devices over the network. And he, working with Bob Kahn, uh, cracked that problem uh, uh, by, by developing something called the TCP IP protocols, which are the rules and the processes whereby when you send an email, it gets taken apart and sent all various little routes and finds its way back together, looking a lot like the, the email that you actually sent. Actually, it looks exactly like the email that you sent. It's extraordinary. You know, if you ask anybody, could you, is that the way to do business? Well, of course not. I mean, <laughs> breaking it all up, sending it God knows where. But it's incredibly robust, and it allows uh, the internet to uh, suffer various failures in various places and still get your little email uh, uh, to me and, and, and vice versa. Uh, President Bill Clinton, Clinton, when I was in Washington, but not yet, I wasn't yet in the White House at that point, presented the U.S. National Medal of Technology to Vince Cerf and his colleague Robert Kahn for founding and developing the internet. He's received many uh, other honors, over two dozen honorary degrees, institutions all over the world, a very long list of awards and prizes. I'll mention just a few. The Turing Awards of the Nobel Prize of Computing, the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush, the Japan Prize, the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, and many others. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and many other honorary organizations. He serves on a number of boards, advisory committees, very generous uh, with his time and helping uh, on a broad front of issues that uh, are important to the American people and people around the world. Uh, he uh, serves, has served, on the, and still does, an advisory capacity on the National Science Board, which, which we uh, say gently uh, works with the NSF director to guide the agency's policies and programs 
it's a great board. I, I love them every one, not every day, but, but every one. Uh, it's a major contribution to serve on that board, I, I should say quite seriously. Some of us actually think that the NSF is a model federal agency. It's a kind of a expressed bias, I guess, on my part unsolicited little comment, but it is a fine agency, and the board is a very important part of it. Uh, Richard Tapia is here. Richard Tapia served on the board, maybe not the same time as you've been. I can't remember if there was overlap. Since 2005, Dr. Surf, Dr. Surf has served as Vice President Chief Internet Evangelist for Google. I'm not sure there are a lot of evangelist titles in the corporate world, but this certainly is one, and it, and it fits. Because in, in this role, he is responsible for identifying new enabling technologies to support the development, the advancement of internet-based products and services. But he also is a very strong advocate for uh, safety, security, and privacy of the internet and making it accessible to everyone. It's been my great pleasure to work with Vint on a number of uh, policy matters over many years. We testified not too long ago for a Senate committee uh, and I'm delighted that uh, you were willing to come here to be with us today, in spite of the fact there's a major storm brewing not all that far south of D.C., which is where you were. So we're going to hear from you on the current future challenges of maintaining a free and open Internet, essentially the future of the Internet. And, and after Dr. Sir presents his lecture, uh, which I hope will not be interrupted by cell phones. I mean, I check mine, so please check yours. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session, but there are enough of us here. It's a big enough group, so if you'll write your questions on cards, I'll try to get to a, to a substantial number of them. We'll sit together on the stage because, heck, we're getting on and years. <laughs> and... <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vince Cerf. Well, thank you. Neil is, uh, is this wonderful eminence grease in my world, and it's been a real pleasure to work with him in a variety of different ways. Um, as you probably know, he not only served as the president's science advisor, but also as the uh, head of the National Science Foundation. So his comments about the National Science Board uh, are of real experience uh, with a variety of people. Uh, the last time we got together and testified, uh, it was before the uh, Senate Science Committee. And at one point, um, I had made an observation. Uh, I don't recall exactly what question elicited this response, but I said, you know, we don't publish any of our failures. And Neil said, maybe we should. And, and, and the point, I think, was really well taken because you learn a lot in the scientific world from failures, things that didn't work. And, and so the, the image that I have, uh, that I try to convey to young people especially, is that there are two kinds of scientists. There's the one that has a theory, which uh, she clings to, and, uh, and does measurements and discovers that the measurements match the theory perfectly well, except for this one point over here. Now, uh, there, may, there are two different kinds of scientists. One of them will look at that point and say, ah, measurement error, and ignore it, and be happy that the theory matches the measurement. The other one looks at that point and says, hmm, that's funny. That's the one that gets the Nobel Prize when they figure out why that you know, point came out on the equation because the theory didn't match the actual measurements. Well, tonight I'm going to try to do uh, several things, but first to give you a very quick sense for the evolution of the Internet from its earliest days. Uh, and then I want to plunge into where we are now and what things challenge us as the Internet continues uh, to uh, grow and to uh, expand uh, into uh, worldwide access. I guess I should say one other thing about my title, uh, which is not a title that I asked for. When I joined Google, uh, Larry and Eric and Sergey said, what title do you want? And I thought a little while, and I said, uh, how about Archduke? <laughs> and so they went away, and they came back, and they said, you know, the previous Archduke was Ferdinand. <laughs> and, and he was assassinated in 1914. <laughs> and it started World War I. So maybe that's a bad title to have. 
why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? And I said, okay, I could do that. The hazard of this uh, it became apparent to me, this particular title, when I was lecturing in Russia, in Moscow, I had four public appearances, and at the end we did question and answers. In every single one of those four uh, lectures, somebody, not the same person, got up and said, Dr. Surf, do you believe in God? And I remember reacting the first time thinking, boy, that's a very personal question to ask in a public setting. So I thought about it for a little while, and I said, well, I'm geek orthodox. <laughs> and, and they got it. And so, so ever since then, when I had to explain, I explained I'm geek orthodox. OK, so now we're going to test whether I can actually control this thing. So let's see what happens. We're going back in time, ladies and gentlemen, to 1969. Uh, at this point, um, I am, let's see, do the math here. I'm 26 years old. I'm in the middle of a PhD program in computer science at UCLA. And I'm working in Len Kleinrock's Network Measurement Center as the principal programmer to measure the performance of a new network called the ARPANET, named after the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. It was experimenting with a technology called packet switching which anyone to do with uh, computer science is familiar with today, but back then it was considered a radical idea. Communications of the day, in, back in the 1960s, uh, were dominated by uh, what is called circuit switching, which is the way the telephone system works. You basically dial a number and a circuit is, is set up dedicating capacity for the two parties who are talking to each other. Even if nobody is talking, the capacity is dedicated to that call until somebody hangs up. In the packet switching world, which is trying to deal with computers that are flinging bits of data to different computers at one after the other very quickly, you have a very bursty kind of communication requirement. Setting up and tearing down circuits is very inefficient. So instead, the packet switching system treats these communications from the computers like they were uh, little electronic postcards. And everything you know about a postcard applies to packet switching. So a postcard has a to address, a from address, and some content. The internet packets have a to address, a from address, and some content. A, a, a postcard, when you put it into the post box, doesn't necessarily come out on the other side of the postal system. It's called a best efforts communication system. This is true of the internet packets as well. If you put two postcards into the post box intended to go to the same destination, they don't necessarily come out in the same order you put them in. This is also true of internet packets. The internet also does something that the post office does not do. And in some cases, when you put an internet packet into the system, it, it will be duplicated and two copies will show up because if there is a, an apparent failure, the system will choose an alternate route and retransmit the packet so it's possible for two of them to show up at the destination. That's not a service from the Postal Service, but that's a service from the internet. Thank you very much. Um, that's about all you need to know about basic packet switching. So uh, when we put the, the system together, uh, we realized that uh, we had this very peculiar kind of best efforts, not very reliable, possibly duplicating and out of order service. So we said, how do we discipline this to make it a useful service? Because on the surface, nobody would want to use that. So we said, well, let's put another layer of protocol on top of the postcard service. The best way to explain this, this is the transmission control protocol or TCP. Uh, basically, it's sort of like what would happen if you were sending a book to a friend through a postal service that only could do postcards. So think about the logic you'd go through. You'd, you'd realize you'd have to tear the pages out of the book, cut them up to fit on the postcards. Then you'd realize that not every postcard would have a page number because you cut them up. And you know that they could get out of order, so you number every postcard, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you know that they might get lost, so you keep copies just in case you have to retransmit them. So you start sending these postcards. Uh, and then you wonder, well, how do I know, you know when, I, when my friend has gotten all of the postcards? And you have this idea, you should simply have your friend send a postcard to you saying, I got everything up to postcard number 420. Except then you realize that postcard might get lost. And so you think, well, what do I do then? And you say, well, you know, look at your watch. See how, whether or not you've gotten any responses from your friend from the postcards you've sent. And if you haven't gotten any, then you start sending duplicates until you finally do get a postcard from your friend saying what they got. 
that's how TCP manages the system. It detects duplicates, it filters things out, puts them back in order and delivers them to the destination. Now you know how the internet works. I've left out a little detail like how the routing system works and how domain name system lookups happen. But basically you're hearing the fundamental uh, essence of the way the uh, system works. It also inherits a couple of other features of the postcards and this is also quite important to the way in which the internet has evolved. In particular, the postcards don't know how they're being carried. It could be in an airplane or a bicycle or a ship at sea or an air, uh, you know, in the back of the carrier. Uh, so that's also true of internet packets. They don't know what medium is carrying them. It could be an optical fiber, could be a radio transmission, could be a satellite, could be a laser. And we didn't care. We basically said we should not notice or care about the details and under, of the underlying transmission system. And that meant if new technologies came along for uh, adding transmission capability, we could just sweep the internet into that. It, was, it would simply ride on top of these new tra transmission technologies. So we tried to future-proof the network design, and that indeed worked out very well. The other thing you'll notice about postcards is the postcards don't know what's written on them. This is also true of the internet packets. They don't actually know what the meaning is of the bits that they're carrying. All they know is that there's a bag of bits that they're supposed to deliver from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. That's all we ask of this underlying system. So the result is that if you invented a new application at the edges of the net, those, uh, the software at the edges interprets the bits of the packet to be whatever the application requires. Could be a piece of audio, could be a piece of, piece of video, piece of a web page, part of a, an email message. But it's the edges of the net, it's the servers that figure out what the meaning is of the bits. Which means that if you have invented a new application, you don't have to change the network because it doesn't know about applications. Again, future-proofing the system for the invention of new protocols. So that's the sort of, that's a level-setting concept behind the internet. So here's the ARPANET. I was a graduate student at UCLA, and I was writing software for the Sigma 7 to connect it to the first node of the, of the ARPANET. Uh, we had a little four-node network, and my uh, good friend Bob Kahn came out as one of the architects of the ARPANET to test the system. My job was to write the software to measure the performance of the system against various kinds of load that we put on the system. And we wrecked the network on a regular basis for several weeks while he was testing to see whether the protocols would be uh, robust in the face of this potential overload. So um, we became very good friends in the process of working on that together. So if we uh, go forward now, uh, Bob came to visit me while I was at Stanford University on, and having joined the faculty in late 72. I was starting to do research on networking and we, he arrived and said to me, uh, Vint, we have a problem. And you know, my first reaction was, what do you mean we? <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, we got this ARPANET thing and it works really well. It connected all kinds of different kinds of computers together, but it was a homogeneous network. The packet switches were all the same. They all came from a company called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. But he said, now that I have moved to ARPA, which he had done about the same time I moved to Stanford, uh, I realized that this network uh, concept could be used for command and control. And the military is very interested in how computers can improve their ability to manage their own resources. A smaller force might overcome a larger one. We used to call that a force multiplier because they manage their resources better through the use of computers. So he said, if we're serious about that, we're going to have to com put computers in ships at sea, in mobile vehicles, and in aircraft. And all we had done up until that point was to link computers on dedicated telephone lines in fixed locations around the United States. So he said, I have been working on a mobile packet radio network and a packet satellite system across the Atlantic to reach all the way from the east coast of the US to the west coast of Europe. But these networks, these packet switch networks, operate in very different ways. The, the data rates were different, the sizes of the packets were different, the error rates were different, the latencies were different, the satellite link was all the way up to synchronous, and that's a quarter of a second up and down and another quarter of a second back. The mobile radio network topology kept changing because things were moving around. So we had three very different kinds of networks uh, to contend with 
in, in order to uh, make it possible to serve all the different locations where the computers had to be. On top of that, about a mile and a half from my lab at Stanford was Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where Bob Metcalf and, um, and his uh, colleagues, uh, David Boggs, had invented the Ethernet, which is something you're familiar with. It has morphed over time into Wi-Fi as well as physical wires, but the Ethernet was yet another network to be contended with in this uh, problem. And the problem, of course, was figuring out how do we interconnect all these different kinds of packet nets in a uniform way? And that is what led Bob Kahn and me to design TCP IP over a course of about six months. Uh, and so by September of 1973, we had figured out how to do this. Uh, in a way, it wasn't as hard as it sounds because the, the problem was so constrained that the, you know, the, the design that satisfied the constraints sort of just leapt out at you. So we published a paper in May of 1974 describing how this would work in IEEE transactions on communications. That, uh, a copy, by the way, of that particular technical publication uh, sold for $25,000 at auction a few weeks ago in New York. So, of course, the first thing I did was look in my files to see if I had any more copies. <laughs> in there. I didn't find any more so much for my retirement plan. So uh, several years went by. We uh, were uh, implementing the TCP IP protocols, testing them. By 1977, I had moved from Stanford to ARPA. And so I was the program manager running the internet program, packet radio, packet satellite, packet security program. And I wanted very much to show that the TCP IP protocols would actually work in a multi-network environment, in a very diverse environment. So I asked the uh, people who were uh, contractors on this effort to do this demonstration. We had a mobile packet radio van driving up and down the Bayshore Freeway in the San Francisco area, radiating packets in the packet radio net, destined to go to USC Information Sciences Institute in Los Angeles, 400 miles to the south. But the path that the packets took was from the mobile packet radio network in the Bay Area through a gateway into the ARPANET, which by this time went all the way across the US through an internal satellite hop to Europe down to University College London. So the packets went that way, got down to London, and then hopped out of the ARPANET through another gateway into the packet satellite net, which went all the way back across the Atlantic to the, United, the east coast of the United States, back through another gateway, and then into the ARPANET again, and all the way across to Los Angeles. So the packets actually effectively only went 400 miles south. But the path that the packets took was about 100,000 miles because they went through two satellite hops, two synchronous satellite hops, back and forth across the US and the Atlantic twice. And it worked. And I remember leaping up and down saying, but it works, it works, you know, like it couldn't possibly work. It's software, and it's a miracle whenever software works. <laughs> So for me, that 1977 test was the most important demonstration to me that this technology actually had legs and could conceivably work with an arbitrarily large number of networks scattered all over the world. And that was, in fact, our vision of how this network would have to grow, not at the time thinking about all the commercial applications, but rather thinking about the Defense Department's need to operate anywhere in the world with an arbitrarily large collection of different kinds of packet switch nets. Well. And come the early and mid-1990s, or 80s, the National Science Foundation, where Neil served as director, um, in fact, got very interested in this technology because they had been building five supercomputer centers around the United States. And they knew that it was very important for the academic community in the US, the research universities, to get access to the resources of the supercomputer centers. They saw this internet thing and decided that they should build a network called the NSFNet to link all 3,000 universities to those data centers. And they very cleverly realized that instead of having one big network and having e the operators of that network have to deal with 3,000 different customers, they said, why don't we create some intermediate level networks to service groups of universities, we'll call them literally intermediate level nets, and then we'd have a dozen of those connecting to the NSF net backbone. So the operators of the NSF net backbone only had a dozen customers to worry about, and each of the intermediate level nets would service the universities that uh, connected to them. This uh, was a brilliant move on their part, and it prefaced 
the uh, organization of the commercial internet, because that's exactly how the commercial network operated. Literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of networks all interconnected uh, to each other, but no central control at all. So NSF invested very heavily in this system. And then um, around 1988 or so, uh, I had moved uh, from ARPA uh, to through uh, uh, MCI, uh, the, a company that uh, had built um, an electronic mail service called MCI Mail, which I uh, developed for them. Um, and then I rejoined my uh, partner, Bob Kahn, in 1986 or so to do research uh, on digital libraries and other applications of the internet. And somewhere around 1988, I realized that the general public wasn't going to get access to the internet unless we could show the private sector that there was a business to be had running internet services. Well, at that point, there was a rule that said no commercial traffic was allowed to follow on the uh, internet, uh, or on, well, on any of the government-sponsored internet backbones. So the Department of Energy, NASA, and DOE, uh, I'm sorry, I said that before, DOE, NASA, NSF, and ARPA all had U.S. government-sponsored backbone networks that were interconnected together to form internet. And they all had an appropriate use policy that said no commercial traffic. So I had just done this MCI mail thing, and I went to the Federal Networking Council, which at the time was responsible for policy for the internet in the U.S., and asked if I could have permission to connect MCI mail up to the internet as an experiment to see whether the commercial email service would interwork with the internet email service, and they said yes. So in 1989, we turned on a gateway between the commercial email service and the rest of the internet, and of course that broke the appropriate use policy because we were now using the backbones to carry commercial traffic. And as soon as uh, we made that announcement, two things happened. First of all, other electronic email service providers like Telemail from Telemet and OnTime from TimeNet uh, and CompuServe and others, which some of you may remember, uh, all said, well, wait a minute, you know, those MCI guys can't have this special position. We want to be connected to the internet too. And they got connected. Well, as soon as they did that, two things happened. First of all, they all discovered that before they had been isolated email services where you had to have an account on any service in order to talk to anybody else. They were all connected through the internet so everybody on any service could talk to everybody else. That was kind of a shocker for the people who thought they had this walled garden. The second thing that happened is in 1989, three commercial internet services popped up. They realized based on this demonstration that uh, there was a real business to be had offering commercial service to others besides the academic and military community. So three networks, UUNet, PSINet, and SurfNet out in San Diego, uh, all got set up uh, in 1989. And when we fast forward now to 1995, NSF sees the growth of commercial internet service and decides it doesn't need to pay for this NSFNet thing anymore. Out of research dollars, you can just buy access to service. So they announced they're gonna shut this network down and replace it with what were called network access points, which is simply places where all the other networks could meet each other and inter interchange traffic. So in so doing, not only did they shut down and save money for the NSFNet backbone, but they also subsidized the creation of a platform for commercialization of the internet. So in 95, we see, we see a uh, significant amount of commercialization and we discover uh, that, the, that the dot boom has started. Now, how did that happen? Well, around 1991, a man named Tim Berners-Lee, who was at CERN, wants to figure out how to allow his physics uh, colleagues to exchange their technical papers with each other electronically, and he invents this idea for the World Wide Web. He invents hypertext markup language so that you could lay out the papers with their images and, and uh, formatted text and everything, and he invents the hypertext transport protocol, which rides on top of TCP IP. And he realizes that the internet is a platform on which he can layer this new set of applications. It goes everywhere. And so no matter where the physicists are, they can reach each other through the system that he puts on top of the internet. So he announces this in December of 1991 and nobody notices. But a couple, except for a couple of guys at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, which was one of the supercomputers that NSF had sponsored. This was Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina. They take one look at this World Wide Web thing, which was text only, and they said, why don't we build a graphical user interface? So they did. It was called Mosaic. 
And what did it do? It turned the internet into something that looked like a formatted magazine. Boy, did that get everybody's attention because the internet never looked like that before. And so one guy named Jim Clark, who had started uh, Silicon Graphics out on the, on the West Coast to build computers to allow for computer graphics generation, took one look at this mosaic thing, flew out and dragged Eric uh, Bina and Mark Andreessen to the West Coast to start Netscape Communications in 1994. And they went public in 1995. The stock went through the roof. The dot boom was on. Billions of dollars started flowing from venture capital companies into anything that looked like it had something to do with the internet. Of course, five years later, there's the dot bust because a lot of those companies didn't really have business models. The CEOs who thought they were so brilliant because all this capital was flowing in discovered that there's a difference between revenue and capital and that you can run out of capital, uh, you know, and revenue is supposed to continue. So a lot of them went bust. The internet kept growing, though, at 100% a year for a while, and it continues to grow today. So uh, we went through the dot, bomb, uh, dot, dot boom and the dot bust. Internet kept growing. So today, this is the, you know, conceptually what the internet looks like. This is actually generated by a program that looks at the global routing tables of the internet and colors each autonomous system with a different color. The important picture here is that there are hundreds of thousands of networks that are interconnected in this system. They are not centrally controlled. They each pick their own software. They pick their own hardware. They decide their own business models. They decide who they connect with and on what terms and conditions. And it all works because they all adopt the same TCP IP protocols and all the others that go along with the internet. So that's what we have today is this gigantic uh, globe girdling system which has no centralized control. It has one element of centralization in it, and that is the unique assignment of domain names to only one party, so you, two people can't have the same domain name, and they do the unique assignment of internet protocol addresses so that we don't have networks that collide with each other because they've been given the same IP addresses. That's all they do is assure that there is uniqueness in the assignment of these key parameters of the internet. And so that's what we have today. Uh, I also have to say, I was in Vanuatu a few weeks ago, which is down in the uh, South Pacific, uh, for an internet governance forum meeting, and I got interested in how connectivity was being done to the islands in the Pacific. I have been astonished to discover that over the past decade or so, an enormous amount of undersea optical cable has been used to link a variety of the islands together, in addition to, of course, the major continental connections. And so there is a lot going on in the internet under, you know, underlying connectivity of the internet. I didn't think that people would spend money on underground cable or under, undersea cable uh, to links of these various islands together, but it's astonishing how useful that's turned out to be. So that's been an exciting and unexpected development in terms of growth of internet. Uh, and there's more to come. There are a number of low Earth orbiting satellites and very low Earth orbiting satellites that are planned either in operation like Global Star or Iridium or planned by uh, SpaceX. Uh, in fact, the numbers are enormous. Uh, what SpaceX has in mind to do is to launch 4,000 um, um, uh, 4, satellites in 83 different orbital planes at uh, you know, about 1,000 a, a uh, kilometers uh, orbit altitude and some others uh, at, at uh, even lower uh, orbit, which means that at 7,000 of them, uh, which will give higher bandwidth because they're closer to the Earth and therefore they get better signal-to-noise ratio. And we at, at Google even announced a project which is now commercial called Loon, which is because it was, it was a short, short for balloon because we intended and have now put balloons up in the stratosphere at about 60,000 feet. The balloons go circulate around the Earth in, in a sort of a fixed latitude, so you can have multiple of them in different latitudes, and they deliver internet service uh, below, wherever the balloon is. And what's truly amazing about this is that uh, we can steer the balloons based on the jet stream, because up in the stratosphere, as you move up and down in altitude, the jet streams go in different directions. So if you know where you need the balloon to go, you adjust its altitude to get a tailwind to deliver you to the right destination, and then you adjust your altitude to get a headwind to keep you loitering where you need to be for a while until you are finally forced to circulate around the rest of the world. So there's going to be an increasing amount of high-speed connectivity around the world, not only from undersea cable, but also uh, from uh, overhead resources. 
including satellites and our balloons. Now, the, the rest of this lecture, uh, I don't have any fancy pictures, but just lots of text. But the rest of this is really about uh, why connectivity to the net is really not enough to make it useful. So the first issue is how much does it cost to use the internet to be connected to it? How much do the, does the equipment cost? And how much does the access to the communications cost? It has to be affordable and sustainable if we're going to expand access to the net. Today, about 50% of the world's population is online. And about 50% is still offline. And it's not like there's just this chunk of space where nobody's online. It's scattered throughout all the countries. It depends on whether you're rural or urban or suburban. It depends on what the uh, average uh, you know, GDP per capita is as to whether you can afford to be on the net or not. And so there are people who can't get on because it's too expensive, either for the hardware or the software or the service. So if this is going to be propagated everywhere, which is what the chief internet evangelist hopes for, then we have to make it both affordable and sustainable. Second, it has to be locally useful. It doesn't do you any good, for example, to be able to search for a plumber and, get, and find one in New York City if you happen to be in Sumatra. And so you need for the system to have useful local content in local languages in order to make it uh, something worth paying for. So that's another big issue. Another thing which is important is that uh, if you're going to sustain this system and you want businesses to grow around the use of the infrastructure or the provision of it, then you also have to have policies that will encourage investment in the infrastructure uh, and regulation that will allow uh, companies to offer these products and services uh, in, in as free a way as possible. And so we really need to make sure that the business sector can take advantage of the existence of the infrastructure and then create new businesses, new jobs, new products and services, not only locally, but also serving communities outside of a domestic setting. So if you're a small island like uh, New Zealand or something with five or six million people and 20 million sheep, um, you, uh, you get now yeah, that's an interesting balance there. Um, you want to be able to serve not only the domestic economy, but serve the rest of the world as well, because the rest of the world's economy is many times larger than any one domestic economy, including our own here in the US. So all of these are important considerations to make the internet a useful thing. We also look for societal utility, at least if we're honest with ourselves, we don't want internet to be there and just, and just make money for people or something or cause trouble. We want it to be of societal value, which means using it to improve healthcare or education or government services or training, uh, online education and things like that. And finally, resilience is really important. I mean, we're faced, uh, you were faced with Harvey not too long ago. Uh, we have Florence on its way to the um, Atlantic East Coast, where I'm trying to fly back tomorrow. Um, and Puerto Rico, of course, was horribly damaged by Maria. So we need systems that are very resilient in their design and implementation, because if they're not, and it goes away, then you don't want to rely on it. You don't want to build a business around it. You don't want to uh, put your own personal uh, lives uh, uh, in a situation where the support that you were relying on goes away. There's also a big issue here now about sea rise because we can see it happening. And we know that things like cable landings are on coastal areas and they may be underwater, which makes it really hard to operate those, uh, those cable landings. So over time, we're gonna have to anticipate that and move the cable landings to higher ground in order to make sure that the undersea cables will work. We also have to worry about the potential hazards of global warming and the potential for increased storm damage, especially for above ground facilities. We'll have to be thinking more carefully about how to design and build uh, resilient infrastructure, which might mean burying cable. Uh, it might mean uh, building um, more resilient systems where we can quickly replace uh, components that have been damaged by uh, various kinds of natural disasters. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, in this. There's a lot of unfinished business, and for this audience, I, I don't particularly want to dive too deep into the technical aspects of this, but I will emphasize the, the importance of standards, because without the standards, the internet wouldn't work at all. It's this collaborative nature of the system only is facilitated by everybody adopting the same common set of standards, and they come from quite a large range of different organizations. The Internet Engineering Task Force, which is very focused on specific 
uh, internet protocols, but the World Wide Web Consortium, which is focused on World Wide Web protocols, the uh, uh, IEEE, uh, Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, that's where the Wi-Fi standards come from, for example. The International Telecommunications Union has a lot of standards, mostly to do with lower level uh, transmission technology. The uh, International Telecommunications Radio Organization, which allocates spectrum and dedicates it to various and sundry applications, very important for achieving uh, internet access. The Internet Standards Organization, or, I mean, International Standards Organization, again, for uh, application space things. Another thing which is really important, and I hope you do appreciate this, is that as time goes on, as we populate our uh, personal universes with devices that have software in them, we all recognize, at least we should recognize, that the programmers of the world make mistakes. Those mistakes are called bugs, and it causes systems that rely on that software to work in ways you didn't intend. And so in many cases, that software needs to be updated. I think it is not only technically important, but it's ethically important that the designers of these devices, the so-called Internet of Things, for example, be prepared to download new uh, software to repair bugs. Uh, and the problem that, that we have, of course, is that we want the device that's ingesting the new software to be assured that it's coming from the right source, that it hasn't been modified on its way from that source to the device so that it's ingesting malware, which we don't want. So there's some technical work to be done to make sure that that's possible. Uh, and that leads me to strong end-to-end -end authentication. We want those devices that are receiving new software to be very sure that it came from a source that they can validate. And similarly, uh, if the device is going to accept control from somebody remotely, like changing the, the temperature in your house or altering the security settings of the house, you want the device to make sure that whoever is controlling it is something that it can recognize and validate, and cryptographic methods are very powerful for that. I think the, you would agree with me that uh, confidentiality and privacy are also important. And in the, just to give you an example of things that you might not think of as being uh, uh, security related, uh, think about temperature information about the, each room in the house. Now, I have temperature sensors in every room in my house, and every five minutes they uh, take the temperature and they transmit it through a little mesh radio network to a server down in the basement. So at the end of the year, I've accumulated information about how well the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning has worked. And I know you'd think only a geek would do that, and that's probably true. But at the end of the year, I actually have good information about how, you know, engineering information about how well the system has worked. But imagine if somebody intercepts that data and accumulates it over a six-month period, they can figure out what the diurnal patterns are of my house, how many people are in the house, which rooms do they occupy, are they at home or not. If you were planning to break into the house, that particular information about the temperature would be a vulnerability for me. To, to say nothing of people invading the house security by just attacking the various devices. So we have to think really carefully about the design and implementation of these systems to think about people's safety, privacy, security, and reliability. There's one other thing on this point that I feel um, you should realize. I don't think that we should design IoT devices, uh, these, these appliances, in such a way that if the house is disconnected from the internet, the house stops working. That would be a really bad design. And there's temptation on the part of the designers to do that because they see a mobile and a Wi-Fi access to the internet and a device that they're controlling and they have a nap and that's it. They think they're done. But you know, if you can't actually get to the device without going through the internet that goes out of the house and who knows where and then back again, you have a really bad design. So I think we need to have local capability to run those devices in addition to whatever the cloud uh, allows us to do. There's something else called IP version 6. Remember I mentioned internet protocol, that's IP. The original design was done, that was done in 1978 or so uh, had IP version 4 with a 32-bit address. All that means is that we could have 4.3 billion things attached to the internet if everything was densely um, uh, identified. And that actually worked really well until about 2011 when we ran out of the IP version 4 32-bit addresses. Now, Bob and I thought that this was just an experiment 
and that we would, uh, in, you know, that we would do a production version of the internet if the experiment worked. But you remember I mentioned to you that in 1988-89, we had this sudden spate of commercial services. It did not occur to me at that moment that by opening this up to the commercial world, we actually were releasing the experimental version of the internet into the public. And so we never actually got to do the production version. Well, the production version is IP version 6. It has 128 bits of address space. That's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. That's the number only the Congress can appreciate. But, <laughs> but, but it, it, you know, that's, that's 3.4 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, which is enough address space to last until after I'm dead. Then it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> So I am pushing very hard to get people to introduce, uh, adopt, and run IP version 6, the larger address space. We have to run both version 4 and version 6 concurrently for a while until everybody is capable of running IPv6. Uh, and so that's a mantra that I keep repeating. Uh, I have a really long talk, which I won't do tonight, on long-term digital preservation. Let me just try to scare you in brief terms. Every one of you probably has a mobile and you've taken pictures with it, and you feel like those bits are going to last forever because there's no way for them to wear out. But I also suspect that some of you in here probably have five and a quarter inch floppy diskettes and three and a half inch floppy diskettes and nothing that will read them. And worse, even if you could read them, it might very well turn out to be something that no software on your current machine knows what to do with. So I actually went through this little thing I got a, uh, on eBay, I got a three and a half inch floppy reader and I plugged it in to the USB port of my Macintosh and I pulled files off of this three and a half inch floppy disk. Guess what they were? They were WordPerfect files. <laughs> I couldn't run WordPerfect on the Mac because nobody was running that particular application anymore. We all have a really serious problem. I'll call it the digital dark age. If we don't pay attention to transmit, transferring these bits to media that we can still read. If we don't preserve the applications that know what the bits mean or translate the bits into formats that new software knows what to do with, we will lose a lot of digital information. And uh, so I'm deeply concerned about that. Not only our personal information, things we would like our families, our children and grandchildren to have, but scientific data that we've accumulated at great cost uh, from, you know, from the uh, LIGO experiments, from the NASA experiments, from uh, the uh, reactors at CERN and so on, uh, or the colliders at CERN. So we really should be paying a lot of attention to digital preservation, another mantra. Um, gosh, let's see, I don't, uh, Neil, what have I done on time? Am I still okay or should I shut up pretty soon? Five minutes, okay. So that's an interesting challenge. Uh, set, your, <laughs> set your modems for, for 50 gigabits a second now. Um, here's a, another, I've actually touched on some of these things. Uh, you see this list here that says reliability, safety, privacy, security, interoperability, and autonomy. This is what I tell my engineers at Google. If you're going to build IoT devices or cyber physical systems, please pay attention to meeting requirements along all of those things. So we've already talked a bit about that. What we've not talked about is what else we've discovered the internet can do. And with all the applications we now see uh, that are supportable in this system, uh, we see a lot of misinformation and disinformation floating around, especially in the social media. We see now how important it is to teach young people and ourselves critical thinking about the content that we see on the net. There is an asymmetry in this environment. It's easy for one person to inject misinformation, disinformation, or malware into the internet and amplify that with botnets, uh, you know, machines that have been invaded, basically taken over, and are capable of uh, uh, distributing content and attacks, denial of service attacks and other things. So there's a highly asymmetric environment here that we never had before. It used to be that you had to own a newspaper in order to publish where you had to have a radio station or a television station, that was a fairly small group of people who had control over the amplifying ability of multimedia, of, of uh, large-scale media. But now the internet offers this to everybody. So that's a big problem. There's also a sociological effect here, which I think we're beginning to appreciate. When people use social media, they often do so because they want 
feedback from their visibility in the medium. And so they, you know, they're on Facebook, they're looking for likes, for example, or maybe uh, they're uh, commenting on some web page and they want the feedback that they get from people reacting to their comments. Well, sometimes the best way to get this kind of reaction is to say something extreme. And so what we're seeing, in my view, and remember, I'm just a computer scientist and not a sociologist, but what I think I'm seeing is a um, tendency for extreme content to show up on the network in order to generate this feedback loop. I want more reactions, and I actually don't even care whether I'm getting a positive feedback or a negative one. If I'm a troll, I don't care. I just want to see people upset with what I just said. So what happens is we've set the stage for more extreme content to show up in these environments because people are looking for that feedback loop. Uh, it's it's uh, almost like a drug uh, or a gambling. You know, when you when you win in a gambling situation, you have an incentive to want to win again. And so you keep betting even while you're losing, hoping to get that hit again. Same is true in this environment. So we have a real problem on our hands to deal with this sort of extremal asymmetric behavior. The digital literacy issue uh, has to do with understanding the risks that you're in in this online environment. Just like we tell kids look both ways before you cross the street, we have to uh, help our young people and ourselves pay more attention to not doing dumb things, like clicking on attachments that we don't know where they came from, uh, or, uh, or going to websites that are known to be uh, potentially hazardous. So we need to teach people more digital literacy. We also are going to need international agreements in order to deal with harms that occur when people are in one country and they harm someone in another country, we're going to need some kind of reciprocal arrangements and agreements on a global scale or at least an international scale uh, where we can help each other deal with bad behaviors, harmful behaviors in the network. Um, let's see. Well, uh, hmm, I can't do this in three minutes, Neil, but uh, let me... Let me just draw this one interesting analogy here. Traceability be, by design is an idea that popped up uh, at a uh, conference that uh, I chaired at Ditchley House in the UK. It was a US-UK conference. And the analogy here, uh, which is intended to draw attention to finding people who have done bad things, the analogy here is license plates. If you think about a license plate, it's usually just a random string of characters. And you don't know what the person is that's associated with that license plate because there's nothing obvious about it. But the police are allowed to know. They are allowed to pierce the veil of apparent anonymity. I'm going to call that traceability in this context. The idea here is that even if we believe, and, uh, and I think legitimately, that anonymity is valuable in some conditions, you shouldn't have to identify yourself just because you're doing a Google search, for example. Uh, or, or if you wanted to call in to a hotline and, and anonymously announce a problem. Anonymity is valuable, but we need to be able to pierce that veil if you are using the anonymity to cause tr trouble, harm other people, uh, cause damage. And so I, this is not a well worked out idea, and, and, but I think that, that we may be, it may be necessary for us to explore this concept for the same reasons that we did that with the license plates on the cars. I think I've already alluded enough to buggy software and malware and you know how much trouble we get into. So I put it on the shoulders of programmers, and I used to be one, that we can't get away by saying it's just a bug anymore. We have to be conscious of developing software that's less buggy. We need new technologies and frameworks for writing software to make it less buggy. Uh, and we need to uh, make sure there are consequences for companies and individuals who generate bad software and don't fix it uh, or allow serious harms to occur. Uh, Self-driving cars would be a very good example of a serious problem in a bug that causes a car to collide with something or self-flying drones that fly around and fall out of the sky or run into things or robots that go crazy. So I think that, that there is an ethic here that needs to grow with regard to software-based systems. And so here at Rice, for example, I'm hoping the computer science department will thoughtfully teach programmers and systems engineers that they have an ethical responsibility to be thoughtful and careful about the software that they release on the unsuspecting public. This is the last slide, so I guess that's pretty good. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize, especially as I have to young students 
that I've talked to today in high school and here at Rice is that the Internet's architecture is still very open. It accepts new standards, new protocols. It invites them. You can add new layers to the system. You can extend layers and add new functionality. The Internet is an evolvable architecture by design. It's still evolvable even though it was designed over 40 years ago. And we've already talked about the Internet protocol layer and how it's stupid, right? It doesn't know how it's being carried. It doesn't know what it's carrying. And that is a benefit. That's not, uh, not a problem. It's actually good. Uh, so we want people to feel free to create, create new services and applications. We want to reduce the barriers uh, to that. But we do need to improve security and security practices. We need two-factor authentication, for example, to protect you from losing your username and password. But as long as you have this second factor, the other party can't invade and, and get access to, uh, to your accounts. And we need incentives for business to make sensible choices about uh, the way in which they offer their products and services around. Think about what we had to do with seat belts and smoking. In the case of seat belts, we told everybody, look, seat belts save lives. And we showed them pictures of what happens when cars crash and people go flying through the window and you know, de defenestrate. But that wasn't enough. We also had to make laws that said, by the way, you can't sell a car in the US without a seat belt. And oh, by the way, if we catch you driving without a seat belt, there will be consequences. So you can see this, the jawbone part had to be backed up by a set of incentives that caused the car manufacturers and you and me as drivers to do the right thing. The same argument could be made for smoking. So the last point here is that the internet, despite the fact that it's now been around and evolving for quite a long time, over four decades, the future isn't written yet. There's still more to be done. It's in the hands of young people to invent new ways to use the technology and to evolve it to make it work better. So that's, the, uh, that's my formal presentation. I hope that, uh, that I've been uh, at least coherent, and uh, I'll be testing that theory in a moment. I thank you all very much for your time. Thank you so much, Vin. Um, I assume we're picking up cards, but I forgot to say how people could get their cards to our staffers who are helping us out. So I guess if you just hold up your card, somebody will come and get it. So, so let me just start. First of all, thank you so much for being here. It's and a pleasure. In such a clear uh, and amusing way, an incredibly complicated uh, technical kind of uh, uh, topic. Um, a book came out recently called President is Missing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. The uh, whole idea was that somebody or other has this wiper uh, technology that can go out and, and wherever it wants to and wipe clean in an irretrievable way everything on your machine, the banks, your home, yes. sort of all the rest of it. Thank you. By the way, we uh, have evidence that that exists already, that it's already been applied uh, to um, the, what is the company Maersk? Maersk uh, is the company that does all the shipping, shipping containers and everything else. They got wiped out by the NotPetya um, uh, virus, which actually went and cleared their disks. So that book, um, I don't know, one of the co-authors was uh, former President Clinton, if I remember correctly. Right. Is it it's Clinton or Obama? Patterson it was Clinton, Clinton book. that's right. So, so he, he may have known about this uh, problem in the course of writing the book. Uh, but the fact is, it's a real threat. So how big is the threat? I mean, how vulnerable are we? We're very vulnerable. We are, I mean, it, look. Don't be afraid. It, 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 here's the problem. The, no matter how hard you try to defend a system, if there's one hole, somebody may find it. And so the, the opponent doesn't have to attack you in every possible vulnerable spot. It only has to successfully find the vulnerability and attack you through that. And so it's an asymmetric problem, again, because you have to lock up and, and plug all the holes, but the opponent only needs to find one. And so it's a very serious issue, and it's one that, that we should not ignore. What's your thought about net neutrality? What's it mean? Where are we? What needs to be done? 
So uh, I was a fairly vocal uh, proponent of this notion. I want to speak only to the US situation because the term net neutrality has been used repeatedly in other countries in the world, but it's speaking to different kinds of uh, circumstances. So in the US, the short story is that in the mid-1990s, there were 8,000 internet service providers. The way you got to the internet back then was to dial up a telephone number, through a telephone number, to a receiving modem and connect to the internet that way. And the best data rates you could get were, you know, maybe 28,000 bits per second, maybe even 50,000 bits a second, which seemed like a lot compared to the 300 bits per second that we used to get in the 1960s. However, broadband technology came along, cable modems and optical fiber modems uh, and digital subscriber loops were introduced in the early 2000s or so, uh, and suddenly you could get megabits per second. However, there was a price to pay for that. First of all, very few organizations could offer those services. A telco, a cable co, uh, typically, uh, could do that. And second, somebody had to come out to the house and install a special piece of equipment for you to take advantage of that broadband access to the internet. And the result of that is that you lost a lot of choice uh, you had, if you were lucky, you lived in an urban part of town and you had two, two possible providers, a cable company and a telephone company. If you lived in the suburban parts, you might have one or the other, have a choice of one. So that was, and if you were in, this, in the rural parts of the country, you might have a choice of zero because nobody bothered to bring broadband service to that part of the world because it was too expensive per consumer. So suddenly, broadband service, which was wonderful, reduce the amount of competition to very little. So then the big concern is that the providers of those services might see an opportunity to take advantage of their uh, monopoly over, or near monopoly over your access to the internet. Let's give, I'll give you a, a fictitious example, so I don't want you to misunderstand that this is accusing anybody of anything. But suppose for the sake of argument, that you are a uh, cable company and your primary product is streaming, uh, is, is video services, you know, many, cha many cha channels, plus internet service. And so your customer signs up and gets some bundle of video services plus high-speed internet. And as a provider now, you're looking at your customer's behavior and you discover that some of your customers are using the internet channel, that broadband channel, to go get video services from somebody else. And so one possible reaction you might have would be, well, why don't I mess up the internet service just enough so that the video doesn't work uh, for them using my competitor's service over the internet and they'll have to come back to me? Well, my reaction to this was that's not okay. You should not interfere with the consumer's choice of where to go and what to do on the internet. Uh, and certainly you shouldn't cut deals with particular service, services to Im improve their access to, uh, to your customer through the internet and inhibit others. This is the, it should be the user's decision of where to go and what to do. So you shouldn't be interfering with the service, blocking the service, or uh, eroding its quality. So that was roughly uh, what I thought the uh, net neutrality thing was about. It wasn't about every packet has to be treated the same. Uh, if there were multiple grades of service, everybody should have had access to those different grades of service at whatever the pricing is, but it should be equally access accessible to anybody. Uh, it didn't say that you couldn't charge more for more consumption. That wasn't what net neutrality was about. But the parties who didn't want any regulation at all tried to obfuscate this by claiming all these other things, that they, they had to treat every packet the same or you couldn't charge for more usage, none of which is true. So the FCC adopted uh, a set of uh, net neutrality policies that met these consumer protections, at least as I saw it. That's been reversed. That's gone away now. The current FCC has abandoned those ideas and not put anything in place to replace it. So now we are all theoretically at risk uh, of bad behavior by the internet access providers. What could happen, and what I think should happen, is that a new title in the Telecom Act should be created that's specific to the internet, as opposed to using Title II, which was about telephony and had all kinds of provisions in it that are irrelevant to internet. So an internet um, title in the Telecom Act would be the appropriate thing. The problem, of course, is that the Congress has had great difficulty passing legislation. 
And so it isn't clear whether even if such a bill uh, existed, whether it would pass, to say nothing of potential lobbying by parties who would object to it. So I hope that we get to the point where we can introduce something like that to protect users from the potential hazards of, of abuse by the internet access providers, but do it in such a way that it's very specific to internet and doesn't commingle a lot of other regulation which isn't relevant. So that's a long answer, I'm sorry, but that's... Thank you, it's a complicated issue. There, there, there are a number of young people here. That's actually kind of a relative term, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes. Sorry. No, I mean, really, students, for example, and parents of students. So the question is, suppose you, you have a student, a young person who wants to get into this game, sort of the internet, uh, the kinds of things you've been talking about. Uh, what would you advise? I mean, kind of hard to know where the future is going, but if anybody knows where the future is going in this area, you're, so, you're it. So you get asked that all the time. What I do, do you get tell asked young that people? a lot. And I'm going to do the graduate student trick, which if you don't know about this, is whenever you're asked a question, the graduate student in particular will amend the question around until he can answer it. Okay, so I'm actually going to answer a slightly larger question, because I am asked, what should I do? What should I study? You know, what business should I go into? And so my first answer today is you should go into astrophysics. Let me explain. We used to think 100 years ago that we knew everything there was to know about the universe, and all we needed to do was to measure the, the physical constants better and we could predict everything. Then Einstein comes along and blows up Newton, and then the, uh, you know, the quantum guys show up uh, and they blow up Einstein. Then the string theory guys come along and they blow up the quantum guys. Now what happens is people like Brian Schmidt, who got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, announced to us that his measurements, along with some colleagues, show that not only is the universe expanding, but it's accelerating. Okay, this was not part of what we thought was going on. What this means is that we're trying to understand why is that, and what did we do? We invent notions like dark energy and dark matter. We don't know what they are, but we gave them labels and it makes us feel better. <laughs> what this really means is that we understand 5% of the universe and the other 95% is a giant mystery. So of course you should go into astrophysics. Nobody knows anything. Anything you do has a high probability of winning the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so that's answer number one. <laughs> okay, answer number two, software is gonna be with us for a really long time. And if you wanna go into a business which continues to have challenges and opportunities and everything else, it's been a fabulous career for me. So software and electrical engineering and things along those lines, very open to possibilities. The th third and fourth things. Third thing is neural electronics. This is interfacing of electronics to our neural systems. And I'm not talking about reading people's minds or anything, but I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, my wife was born with normal hearing in, uh, well, I won't tell you what year, because uh, she'd get angry at me if I did that. But anyway, she was, she was born with normal hearing, but when she was three years old, she lost all of her hearing because she had spinal meningitis and the high temperature burned the little cilia hairs inside the cochlea that normally move uh, in synchrony with sound coming in and signal to the auditory nerve what the frequencies the brain is detecting. So she was profoundly deaf from age three. Well, I, I met her and married her uh, in 1996, I'm sorry, in 1966. Uh, and, uh, 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 in 1966, so we just celebrated our 52nd anniversary, um, she got a cochlear implant in 1996. Uh, and this is amazing, right? You go in for this operation, they put in inside the cochlea, they, they snake a little uh, series of electrodes on a wire plus some electronics. It's all sealed up inside the head. The electrodes touch the auditory nerve inside the cochlea. Then they outfit you with a speech processor, which is basically a computer. It's about the size of a mobile. And it takes sound in from a microphone, analyzes the sound to figure out which frequencies are present, and then it decides, based on a map, which of the electrodes it's going to stimulate in order to emulate what the uh, auditory nerve would have done if it were working properly. So it signals the brain the same way it would have been signaled with the normal biological ear, and it works. So she got all outfitted with this thing, they turned it on, and in about half an hour after they outfitted the map, she picked up the phone and called me on the phone. 
And we had a conversation on the phone for the first time in 30 years of marriage. That was 20 years ago. So um, I, this is kind of a profound change for her. By the time I got home, I discovered I had a 53-year-old teenager at home. <laughs> she could, wouldn't get off the phone. She'd answer anything, you know, solicitations and everything else. I was, I, at the time, I was a senior VP at MCI, running engineering. And so she would get a call from AT&T, and they would call and say, would you like to switch? You know, and she would say, hi, uh, where are you? Oh, you're in India? No, which, which country, you know, which, which city are you in? This would go on for a while, but half an hour later, this poor soul on the other end is saying, so are you going to switch to AT&T? And she says, no, my husband works at MCI, but thanks for calling. <laughs> she hangs up. Then, then she called the library. Now remember, she's on the phone. She calls the library and she says, I'd like to sign up for Books of the Blind. She wanted to be able to listen to words that she hadn't heard before. And so they said, fine, no problem, you know, name, address, phone number. Now, you're blind, aren't you? And she says, no, I'm deaf. And there's this long pause. <laughs> and tell me, How, how's that going to work? She listened to 500 books on tape. Uh, and, and now she knows about accents and mispronunciations and everything else. Then she got an FM transmitter which a speaker like me, or uh, uh, Neil, could, <laughs> uh, names, they never stick, uh, could wear this little transmitter. She could, she could receive the FM transmission from 150 feet away and enjoy the, the lecture. So she takes that with her to things like this and also to noisy restaurants. And so her favorite trick is to leave the FM transmitter and its microphone on the table in the restaurant and go to the ladies' room. She can still hear everything that everybody is saying. You know. So we have to tell everybody, don't say anything you don't want Sigrid to listen to, because she might be snooping. So this is a magnificent technology. And the reason I go into this, apart from the fact that it's a wonderful story, is that neural electronics are advancing rapidly. We're learning how to do ocular implants. We're learning how to do spinal implants for people who've lost the use of their limbs. We can learn to relay the, the uh, sensory motor signals past the uh, damage in order to recover uh, our capabilities. So that is a really hot topic that I think would be well worth and now I finally discovered that if I were to go back, uh, I would conceivably go into microbiology. I have become fascinated by the way cells work. So I got a book uh, called The Microbiology of the Cell. It's about 1,700 pages long. And you know, I used to think of cells as a little bag of chemicals, and they bump into each other, and stuff happens every once in a while. That was my simple model of a cell. It turns out that's a really bad model. It's like Manhattan in there. It is packed, dense, all kinds of things are going on. And so I've now become completely fascinated by the way in which intracell and intercellular communications works. And so if, I think if I were starting over again, knowing what I now know, I would probably have gone into microbiology. You're going to go so back that, to school, are you? I, I, you know, Siri, I've been reading through this book. I've been uh, going to the, its authors and asking questions. It's absolutely fascinating. Amazing. Okay. We so, talked earlier about China, but also India is, uh, is, is a good question about where those two countries are, how they compare. Are they threats to the United States in some way from a competitive point of view or other perspectives? Just say a word about China and India. I mean... So the first thing is that they have more people than we do. Uh, and that's actually a significant point, because the distribution of intelligence is pretty much uniform in all populations, which means that uh, China, for example, has four times the population we do, which means they have four times as many smart people than we do. They're not smarter than we are, but there's four times more of them. Same is true in India. And we can frankly see uh, some of the consequences of that, because some of the smartest of uh, our Indian and Chinese colleagues have come to the United States. They come to our universities. They have done extremely well. They've invented new things. Some of them have stayed and are running important corporations, for example, uh, Microsoft and Google. So uh, their work, in my view, presents a significant challenge to us simply because of the significant number of very smart people they have. Second, especially in China, there is a very vibrant um, uh, economy there. They have been growing very, very rapidly. Uh, while they are not yet at our scale, they are going to be at our scale in the foreseeable future. It could be 2030 by the time that happens, but it is almost inevitable. 
that their uh, economy will uh, be larger than the U.S. economy. Uh, they have been very engaged in uh, uh, dealing with non-domestic non uh, economies, including our own. They are high producers of, of uh, very high quality uh, materials. So they present a very significant challenge from the economic point of view, from the intellectual point of view, and from the military point of view. They have the largest navy in the world now, as I understand it. It's bigger than ours. So uh, this is a, an adversary, a potential adversary, not to take lightly. Uh, and that means that we should be paying a lot more attention to uh, our uh, technology. Uh, you know, how, do we, how do we compensate for the fact that we have a smaller population? Well, robotics may turn out to be a very important part of the answer to that. But the Chinese have figured that out, too. As their economy has gone up, uh, the uh, average wage per uh, worker has also gone up, which means that their competitiveness based on low labor costs is starting to erode. Their answer to the problem is to increase the amount of dependence on robotics. And so they're increasing their investment in robotics. They're also increasing their investment in artificial intelligence of all kinds, including machine learning. Uh, Google, rec recognizing this and having already made a very big investment in artificial intelligence, has actually opened up an AI uh, operation in Shenzhen, China, with a fairly large number of locals who are contributing to our use of artificial intelligence. So I think the, the fundamental answer here is, is this is a very um, significant uh, competitor uh, in all dimensions that, that we should care about. Uh, and that means that we should not ignore this at all. We really have to, our science and technology policy uh, needs to be adjusted to take into account that kind of competition. Uh, India has been slower to uh, evolve a more coherent science and technology and uh, economic um, uh, structure in order to benefit its people. But you've seen some significant changes there. A lot of uh, exported work on software development, you know, Infosys is an example. Uh, or Wipro, are companies that do a great deal of software development for other countries in the world. So these are, are both significant um, uh, potential competitive uh, challenges for us. So, I mean, thinking more generally about science and technology, some of our political leaders seem to have a hard time thinking about the importance of cooperation at a certain level with a country like China, Chinese students in our universities, and we going there, collaborating on research projects, uh, why that's important, even if you're in a very competitive position with the country. So uh, again, if they haven't actually worked in a research lab, and most uh, political leaders that come to immediately to mind have not spent a lot of time in a laboratory of a university or a national lab or anything else. So they really don't get it. The thought being, well, if you let people come from a country A to learn something in your country, that's bad. That's oh, but just it, all negative. You know, so, so what's your view on this issue, which right. is very difficult to so discuss? You, you won't be surprised that you and I are very much aligned on this. Listen, it is so much smarter for us to bring those really smart people here to the U.S not only to learn, but to discover and invent. We get the advantage of having those inventions and that knowledge right here. In the, and some of them stay, which is even better. Yeah. So my view of this is we'd be crazy to, to push these people away because we get the advantage of what they invent and learn uh, right here on the spot. And then look at our venture capital system, our system of entrepreneurship is better than any other place in the world. I mean, we know how to take technology and knowledge and turn it into products and services and businesses. So from my point of view, it's the best thing we could possibly do is to bring these smart people and put them in our universities and hope that some of them will stay, but at least take advantage of their inventions, because that's what the academic world is about. We don't buy information from each other. We share information with each other because that is mutually reinforcing. So I can't even understand an argument that says it's bad to have these smart people here. But it is a difficult conversation to have. Sure, you and I agree. And John Deutsch wrote an article not long ago, or a couple of articles. He was a former deputy secretary of defense, former head of CIA, uh, MIT provost at one point, and on the faculty there for a very long time. So he 
would care about national security, any implications uh, that would be negative to the country. But he articulates the, the importance of cooperation in pretty much the same way you just, he said, look, you'll lose, you'll lose something around the edges, but there's no question that by putting up barriers, uh, either, either through a visa control or in other ways, ITAR, uh, export controls, um, the more you do of that, uh, the more we stand to lose. Well, with yeah. the exception of some areas that really are critically important to, uh, to our to national To defense. national security, but on the whole, I mean, think about it, even during the Cold War, we had East-West cooperation. Remember the International Institute for, uh, was it, uh, EASA, the International right. Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, where the, uh, the, usually the head of that operation was an American, and the, um, the, the deputy was a Russian, and we all knew he was KGB, but it was okay because we shared the results uh, and so this scientific exchange has value, even in the, in the uh, context of uh, you know, kind of either competitive or even adversarial conditions. Uh, some, some folks think the Russians are after our elections. How do we deal with that? Yeah, wow. Um, so this is part of the asymmetry that I tried to talk about earlier, about the ability to cause a great deal of trouble. Uh, by amplifying whatever it is you've done using botnets, computers that have been turned into devices that can pretend to be people, in effect. So this is actually a really serious problem because the social networks, which thrive on what looks like human feedback to reinforce a particular statement or assertion, remember we talked about extremes and things like that, um, you can't tell the difference. The software of the uh, of these social networks can't tell the difference between a human and a computer pretending to be a human. Some of you remember seeing the imitation game about Alan Turing, and you remember the Turing test was a person interacting textually with either a human or a computer, but he couldn't couldn't see which was which. And the idea was that if you couldn't tell which was a human and which was a computer, then the computer had successfully passed the Turing test. It had pretended to be a human, and a human couldn't tell the difference. Uh, I'm making this up on the fly, there is a Turing test too, where you have a computer and a human and a computer, and the computer is trying to figure out whether it's a human or a computer that it's talking to, and if the computer can't figure out the difference, it fails Turing test too. That's, that's what's happening in the social networks. They can't tell whether uh, an assertion or a like or some other thing was generated by another computer program or whether it was a person. And if you can't tell the difference, then statistical analysis of what people like and don't like becomes distorted dramatically by the things that are pretending to be people. And so we have a serious challenge ahead of us to try to either inhibit the creation of botnets which goes all the way back to making things less easy to break into, which goes all the way back to creating less buggy operating systems, which goes back to inventing programming environments that warn programmers about stupid mistakes that they've made, which we have not done very well with over the past 70 or 80 years. So we need to, we need to go back to really basics here in order to deal with some of those problems. Uh, what's Google Zero? Is it a big deal? Google, alpha, alpha zero. Alpha zero. Okay. Alpha go zero. It is a big deal. Um, some of you will have uh, noticed that uh, the Google has made heavy use of machine learning. One of the companies that we acquired in England is called DeepMind. And DeepMind started experimenting with uh, neural networks that are hundreds of layers deep. Back in the 60s, there were some experiments with a one level deep neural network. These things were called perceptrons. And we tried to use, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't uh, one of the de you know, developers of this, but um, as a, an ob observer, uh, I could see attempts being used to feed an image of a, of a graph, for example, to a neural network and have it try to figure out whether the graph was connected or not. And it turned out that the neural network had difficulty because it wasn't getting enough information to figure out whether it was connected. So it wasn't solving a really fundamental problem. And so uh, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert at MIT wrote a book called Perceptrons saying they're crap. That's sort of the summary of their book. <laughs> and, and, and so it, it put the kibosh on another technical term uh, on, uh, on research in this area for quite some time. 
But there were some people who didn't give up, and eventually the deep mind guys developed techniques for building hundreds of level deep neural networks. And the consequence of that is that they began to see ways in which these neural networks could, um, could do interesting problems. For example, uh, distinguishing one image from another. For example, classifying images of animals, dogs, cats, kangaroos, and so on. Uh, in one case, they decided to use these neural networks to train to play a game called Go. Now, Go is actually harder than chess because it has a 19 by 19 board, whereas chess is only 8 by 8. So the number of potential moves in Go is astronomically big. But they uh, ran this neural network, this very deep neural network, and um, taught it to play Go, or it taught itself really to play Go. And then they played Go against Lee Sedol, who was a uh, South Korean expert, and he lost four out of five games. Well, this was kind of a shocker because this is a very, uh, you know, very hard game to play. Uh, and uh, they used this neural network to do that. But, and then afterwards we played this uh, similarly uh, with some Chinese players and, and we beat all of them. But then the guys at DeepMind went back and re-examined how they had done this AlphaGo program. And they invented what they called AlphaGo Zero. And in this case, instead of playing against humans, they simply taught the machine what the rules of Go were so that it, it knew how to make a legal move. And that's all that they showed it. They had it play with itself. They had different versions of the program playing against itself. And within about 30 days or so, the AlphaGo Zero machine learned to play Go better than any known Go player or Go player program. Then they taught it how to play chess. And within a few, it, it may have been either a few hours or at most a few days, it played better chess than any known chess playing program in existence. So this is kind of creepy in a way that this system could learn to do this. The thing that should make you more comfortable is this is an incredibly narrow skill. I mean, this is not a survival skill, except in the context of game playing. So we shouldn't run away and be scared about these kinds of things. They are very narrow in their applications, but they're very powerful in those narrow applications. So to give you one other example of more practical uh, utility, uh, in our data centers, uh, we have to keep them cool because the uh, computers run very hot. So we have water flows and pumps going around cooling the, the data centers. And every week, we would have a human being kind of looking at how well we had done, trying to adjust the parameters to reduce the amount of power required to run the pumps. So that was our metric of goodness, was reduce the amount of power required. So somebody said, why don't we train a neural network to do this? And so they decided, well, that's an interesting idea because you could be getting the information about the, the power flows and everything else in real time. So they trained the neural network to cool the data center, to adjust all the parameters. They saved 40% of the power cost to, save the data, to cool the data centers. So of course the reaction was, let's go do this in all the other data centers. That is a very practical application of machine learning. Now, before you get uh, overly enamored of machine learning, I want you to understand how brittle it is. So uh, remember we talked about the image recognition of cats, dogs, kangaroos, and so on? Well, it turns out that after all the training that you do, the systems are really very, very good at distinguishing you know, these various categories of animals. However, uh, let's imagine that you're distinguishing cats, dogs, and kangaroos and uh, you show it a picture of a cat, and it says it's a cat. So you pat it on the, on the uh, transistor. And then, and, and then you change three pixels in this image of the cat. Carefully, you change particular pixels, which from you, your point of view, my point of view, hasn't changed the image of the cat at all. And the system says it's a kangaroo. And you're sitting here saying, WTF. And, <laughs> So what has happened, what has happened is that in this, I'm going to try to this, I don't know if it's going to work, uh, in this deep multi-layer network, hundreds of, of layers deep, 
the system has ingested an enormous amount of state information based on the images that it's seen. Okay, now we're gonna, I'm gonna try this, and I don't know if it's gonna work. Um, imagine for a moment that you have an image of 100 by 100 pixels. So there's 10,000 pixels in that image. And each pixel, let's pretend, has a value of zero or one, black or white. I want you to try to imagine for just a moment that it's a 10,000 dimensional space, not the three space that we think of now with you know, the left and right and uh, forward and back and up and down, but 10,000 dimensions. So a vector in a 10,000 dimension space has 10,000 values associated with it, just like you would have a vector, a three-dimensional vector has you know, a distance this way, a distance that way, and a distance that way, and the vector is over here. It's like an arrow with three values. How far did I go to the left? How far did I go to the right? And how far did I go up? So that vector has these three values, and as those values change, the point of the vector would move around in three space. Imagine having a 10,000 dimensional space which represents the image. Now imagine that you're training the system to distinguish a variety of different images from each other. Each image that shows up has a vector that points to a particular place in this 10,000 dimensional space. As you're training to recognize the images and to distinguish them, you're building hyperplanes that separate the vectors from each other. So there's a group of vectors over here that represent cats, and another group over here that represents dogs, and another group over here that represents kangaroos. The machine learning process is very dependent on which pixels were used to train the system to separate these groups of vectors from each other. But the hyperplanes could be positioned in such a way that a vector is very, very close to one of those hyperplanes. And so if you change a couple of pixels, the vector pops up, crosses the boundary into a different category. And so that's how you could accidentally, with small changes, have the thing say it's not a cat, it's a kangaroo, because of the value of those three pixels that you carefully changed. This is called an adversarial system where you try to find the right pixels to cause confusion. I'm sorry, that's a really long harangue here. But the, the reason I tell you this is I want you to understand that as good as these machine learning tools are, they are brittle. They are brittle, and so you can consequently have unexpected mistakes made because the system, was, even though it was trained across all these variables, uh, can have mistakes like that happen. So we should be both grateful for how powerful these are. We use it to do um, language translation, natural language translation. And if you use Google for that purpose, you may have discovered that it's getting better and better with certain languages. Some of them for which we don't have enough samples, we don't do as well. But for the ones that we have lots and lots of samples, like uh, English and French and German and the Romance languages and so on, we actually do pretty well. We still make mistakes. But by using machine learning, we've gotten a lot better. OK, I'm sorry. It was a really long answer. No, no, thank you. Not, not at all. I mean, it's, 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 it works. Which you just, had you chosen 1,000 dimensions instead of 10,000, it would have been a little faster. Or 10 million, or yeah. <laughs> I want to thank uh, our evangelist for being with us and doing such a spectacular job. Uh, there's nobody like him in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I apologize for not getting to everybody's card, but I'm going to share these with Vince so he can see that you all are thinking. There's no place like rice. So I have, I have a question. If, if, I, if you give me the cards and yes. I send you answers, yes. uh, will you share, is there a way to share them with everybody? Well, if some of you would like to follow up on your answers, I think the best way to follow up on your questions, of course I will do that. But just send me email, neal, N-E-A-L, at rice.edu. And I will, with my helpers, figure out how to connect. <laughs> how to connect the answers to the questions. Actually, if you didn't mind, what we might do, uh, you know, there's no obscenities this in is a anything, public. But, this is a public yeah. lecture, so I don't mind having the answers show up in some public setting on your website, okay. for example. Well, the least, least we can do, certainly, is to accumulate answers to as many questions as you have time to answer, and then anybody sends an email gets the, okay. whole, gets the whole schmear. Only costs you about five bucks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Neil at Rice. Neil at Rice. Okay. Thank you for offering that. Thanks so much, Neil. That was a lot of fun.